You're watching Beyond Market. Welcome, I'm Esther Awuni. On today's show, we'll explore ways to reshape healthcare in Africa. You can join the conversation with the hashtag Beyond Market, and you can follow my Twitter handle too, at Esther O. Awuni. Now, according to the World Health Organization, if Africa, African countries cannot achieve universal health coverage, the region will likely suffer a loss of about 2.4 trillion US dollars annually. Dr. Michael Obeng, owner of Miko Plastic Surgery, joins me to explore ways to reshape healthcare in Africa. Dr. Obeng, thank you for joining us today. Now, many, there have been several, several calls uh, for uh, Africa to make drastic reforms uh, in its healthcare uh, sector, especially at the primary uh, health you know, care uh, at the community level. I mean, just a few days ago, Nigeria declared uh, a state of emergency on maternal and child mortality at the primary and healthcare and community level. So obviously that is usually, that is where uh, the, the problem starts. But let me just hear your thoughts on the state of uh, the healthcare in Africa. You're doing some work here in Africa also, which we'll also talk about later on, on the show. But let's just start with you sharing your perspective on the state of healthcare in Africa. Thank you very much, Esther. Thank you for having me in the studio. Uh, the state of healthcare in Africa uh, needs to be revamped. Uh, the state of healthcare in Africa is really at its infancy. Uh, when you look at the continent and the number of people on this continent, we have over 1.2 billion people the second largest continent, and the second largest population in the world. However, you know, we only account for 1% of the healthcare expenditure, and that goes to tell you how healthcare is lacking in Africa. Now, I have traveled around the, the, the continent uh, through my nonprofit work with Store Worldwide, Inc. And, of course, I haven't been to all the 54 countries in Africa, but the few that I have been to Every time that I bring volunteers to this continent, the biggest and the prayer is that they say that, God, I hope I don't get sick on this, in this country. Uh, the infrastructure is not up to date. And even the places that have great infrastructure, the personnel is not up to date on training. Uh, the equipment are also outdated. So just all in all, the state of health in Africa is in dire need. And we need to start rethinking how we can bring healthcare to Africa to first class or to world class level. Uh, you know, we live in such a global village at this particular point. You know, we are doing business all over the world and people are traveling, you know. And when you travel to places such as our continent, everybody prays that they don't get sick because of where we are in our healthcare. So, yes, healthcare is a at its infancy, but it doesn't have to be like that because of the fact that we have the resources, you know, we have the brains, but we need to put our collective efforts together so that we can bring healthcare to the forefront and make health care the conversation uh, to talk about. Now, Dr. Obeng, what we hear and what we see these days is, you know, the, the huge infrastructure gap on the African continent and the billions and billions of uh, U.S. dollars uh, that need to be spent on an annual basis for Africa to catch up. And we've seen this take precedence uh, in, you know, African countries' uh, annual budgets. So it would appear that there's more of a focus on, uh, on capital expenditure or uh, spending on infrastructure and things like education and healthcare, unfortunately, are left out. So many have said that you know, it's simply a priority problem for many African governments in terms of prioritizing uh, things like health uh, or making them just as important as infrastructure. Do you share that sentiment too? Totally, Esther. Uh, you know, our priorities uh, have been very misplaced. Uh, we put emphasis on things that truly do not matter. Of course, we live in Africa. We love our sports. You know, people are spending more money on soccer preparation for World Cups and so on and so forth. You know, why the healthcare sector has been ignored. Now, I can give you examples upon examples visiting different countries in Africa where they have misplaced their resources on things that do not really matter. You know, one thing that we always forget, that when people are healthy, they can create more wealth. I've always said that a healthy nation is a wealthy nation. When people are healthy and working and uh, uh, contributing to the economy, the GDP only goes up. So yeah, you are absolutely right. I think our priorities need to be set straight. Uh, we need to focus more on healthcare, but we cannot focus on healthcare without the basic education about healthcare. Sometimes we feel immortal. Sometimes we feel like, oh, we have so much money, we're not gonna die. When we are sick, 
We can get on our airplanes and fly to London. We can get on airplanes and go to Paris. But one thing that I always tell friends of mine and I always tell people when I get an opportunity to talk to them is, did you know that in the middle of the night, if you can't breathe, I don't care how much money you have, you're not going to make it. So what do you mean by that? I said, by the time you, you summons your, your private jet, the people, what, at least, what, two hours for that? By the time you get to London, six, seven hours from most of the western parts of, of Africa, okay? Even in a, in, in a country like the United States where I live in Los Angeles, one third of the population who are having a heart attack will not make it to the hospital, okay? And the people who make it to the hospital, about 30 to 40 percent will not survive. So what makes us think that we, in the middle of the night when we can't breathe, when we are having a heart attack, we can make it safely. Now, we've heard all the stories about people going to hospitals and they don't have oxygen, that the oxygen sh is a shortage of oxygen and they have to go buy their own oxygen. And I can tell you countless number of stories of friends of mine, family members, people who have shared their stories with me, how their family one died because of lack of oxygen. This is the basic oxygen. We're not talking about one billion dollar infrastructure that killed a person. So you are absolutely right. Now, Dr. Oba, you know, for, for those who are spending or who are trying to spend as much as they can on the healthcare, on the healthcare sector each year, and many times the money simply isn't enough. And that's why we also have conversations about getting the private sector on board to help, you know, also, you know, put more money into the sector, you know, build hospitals, you know, uh, bring on the capacity building, et cetera. What are your thoughts on that in terms of how Af the strides Africa is making, in terms of uh, making this being led by the private sector, getting the private sector on board in order to you know, complement efforts of the fiscal authorities? The private sector plays a key role and should play a key role. Uh, if, you look, if you look at the Western world, where healthcare is far more advanced than where we are in Africa right now, most of these successful and most of these great institutions, they are not government institutions. They are there because of the private sector. And now I see how uh, the private sector in Africa is investing in healthcare. And I think they are know the reason why, because they want their people to be healthy, to contribute. Uh, the private sector, the healthcare in Africa is not gonna thrive without participation from the private sector. The recently held meeting in Cape Verde that goes to tell you the progress that we are making. But I think that the private sector should take more initiative. The government cannot do it all. You know, the government can do so much, but the private sector can definitely chip in and advance healthcare in Africa. So I totally agree with your question and the little solution that you gave. Well, let's, <clears throat> let's quickly talk about the work that you do. Uh, I know that, I mean, obviously you have your own plastic surgery outfit. You also have a foundation restore. Uh, you're also making investments in the healthcare uh, sector here in Africa, investing in uh, hospital units, providing medical equipment and securing personnel also for some hospitals. Just help us understand uh, what, first of all, led to the, the, the creation of restore, what it means and what your vision is for the healthcare sector in, uh, in Africa. So basically, just for those of you who don't know who I am, I was born and raised in Ghana, uh, West Africa, the western part of where we are. Um, at the age of 20, I had the opportunity to go to the United States, went to college, medical school, subsequently did my fellowship at Harvard, and I took a job as the youngest chief of plastic surgery at a hospital in uh, Northeast Ohio. Uh, you know, growing up in Ghana, you, I witnessed a lot of diseases and illnesses that were attributed to supernatural forces. But you know, after going through school, you realize that, you know what, these are the same phenomenon that happens in the Western world. It's not witches, it's not juju, it's not whatever you want to call it. You know, we, are, we have cleft flip and pallet. We have women who are born with one breast. There is a science behind it. So knowing that and being so blessed, uh, and also through the advice of my mentors, Dr. Phillips and Dr. Harry Hancock, I decided to form Restore. A Restore is an acronym. It stands for Restoring Emotional Stability Through Outstanding Reconstructive Efforts. And that was inaugurated in 2008. And since 2008, we have been to over seven different countries and over three different continents. And we have done in excess over 500 surgeries. And if you were to, if you were to put a numerical value on it based on US standards, we are talking about $35 million worth of surgeries for free. And I have personally contributed over $300,000 to 
uh, into restore, to make restore work. You know, and we continue to touch these countries. And not only we go there to do free surgery, we also teach the uh, surgeons in those localities and teach them the, the techniques so that they can be of help when we leave the place. Now, even the Bible talks about you know, teaching men how to fish. So that's what Restore does most of the time. Uh, right now, I'm on my way to Kenya when I leave South Africa uh, to explore uh, the next Restore trip, which is coming up in the, in the fall in Kenya. Also, a group is being put together right now for Gabon. Uh, Restore is going to be doing the great works it does in Gabon from June 8th through the June 16th. So that's what Restore does. But of course, my private job or my, my, my day job, the job that pays my bills is my plastic surgery office in, uh, in Los Angeles, in Beverly Hills. I also have uh, a consulting firm, uh, Global Health Solution. And this is the firm that we use as, as, a, as an arm to educate countries about their healthcare needs. Uh, Every country that I have visited in Africa, there is some form of need, either infrastructure, either personnel, or either equipment. And Global Health Solution is bridging the gap you know, between morbidity and mortality. Okay, we'll uh, just take a quick break. Well, thank you for your time so far, Dr. Obang. We'll just take a quick break right now. I will come back and pick up from where we left off. I've been speaking to Dr. Michael Obang, is owner of Miko Plastic Surgery. If you're just joining us, Dr. Michael Obang, owner of Miko Plastic Surgery, is with me today, and we're exploring ways to reshape healthcare in Africa. Dr. Obang, now you have said that there is an overwhelming need for reconstructive surgery in developing countries, particularly here on the African continent. But when you first came, help us understand what the landscape looked like. I'm talking about reconstructive surgery, the gaps that you saw, and how, how you're helping to plug those gaps like capacity building and training. People look at plastic surgery uh, basically as something to make things better, to make people look better, for vanity. But you know, plastic surgery, the way it was started, you know, plastic surgery became very popular after World War I for reconstruction purposes. But of course, it dates back to uh, the 580s, a very long time ago. And plastic surgery is a word that has been derived, or derived from the Greek word plasticos to mold. So when you look at plastic surgery, it's not just for the beauty. It's not for the, for the um, what I call uh, the T's and A's. Plastic surgery, the core value of plastic surgery, and most of the plastic surgery done in the world is in the form of reconstruction. So to give you some perspective, I live in Beverly Hills. I work in Beverly Hills, where in a one-mile radius, there are over 300 plastic surgeons in a one-mile radius. Let's project this to Africa, where we are right now. Ghana, for example, the first time I started doing Restore in Ghana in 2008, there were five and a half plastic surgeons. And I say five and a half because one person was semi-retired. It was a Welsh plastic surgeon who had devoted his time to be on the continent or to be in Ghana to help out. So he counted himself as half, and in a joking way. You look at Togo, Togo for example, right now, let's go back to Ghana. Ghana, for example, now has about what? Almost 30 million people. And there are less than 15 plastic surgeons in Ghana. This is being just uh, conservative on the high end. Look at Togo, Togo for example, the last time I checked, which was about a year ago, for a population of 11 million people, there is not a single plastic surgeon. Look at Gabon, a country I've been there two or three times, and I'm going back in June. The whole country of 1.2 million people, there is not a single plastic surgeon. This goes to tell you, it tells you the need of plastic and reconstructive surgeons. We are not here for the glitz. Plastic surgeons' main job is for reconstruction. Bad salts, which we call pressure ulcers, injuries, accidents, you know, craniofacial surgery. All these are things that forms under the realm of plastic surgery, and we are truly, truly under you know, the, the quota, or so to speak. So there is a need for building plastic surgery capacity in Africa, especially the West Africa and the East Africa. I know South Africa can stand on their own two feet, but the rest of Africa needs help when it comes to plastic and reconstructive surgery. And the goal of Restore is to reach out to some of these countries and help train the next generation of plastic surgeons. Can you tell us how many that you've trained so far? One, uh, second question, what, what is the most common reconstructive surgery that you do in developing countries? So how many have I trained so far? 
I can't put a number on it, but I can definitely tell you there are about two plastic surgeons in Ghana who have been under my tutelage and have gone on to seek higher uh, fellowships. Uh, one of them is Dr. Paekol, uh, who is now the chief of plastic surgery at Konfonochi Teaching Hospital. Uh, you know, I was uh, one of his inspirations and I was there when he was a student and he took to plastic surgery because of the things that he saw when we worked in Ghana. Uh, we've trained some people in Gabon. But you know, you cannot train a person in plastic surgery overnight. You know, it took me six years after medical school to train under a group of surgeons. So that is missing. One of the biggest problems in, in building capacity in terms of training is part of training. A lot of times these surgeons will travel, go to different countries, country after country. Most of these countries, they cannot touch patients. They can only watch. Just imagine learning how to ride a bicycle without actually getting on a bicycle. How far can you go on it? So that's what's missing. And what, that's the part that Global Health Solution is trying to do, is to build capacity in that sense by bringing people to those countries who need help and sit and train them over a period of two years. And this does not, uh, it's, it's a costly endeavor, you know, costly endeavor because it's hard to find somebody to leave the comfort of your home, to come and sit in uh, a Western African country or any country, a developing country, for, so to speak, uh, and work. Of course, they have bills to pay. So we are trying to raise capital so that we can do this on a mass scale. The most common reconstructive surgery that we have embarked on or we have taken over is, a breast, uh, is reconstruction of brain victims. The brain victims uh, are very, they are very common in you know, every country. And some of the sad stories that we hear, women being burned out of uh, anger by their spouses. Uh, most of the cases that I have encountered in Ghana are women who have been burned uh, because they, re they don't want to be in a relationship no more. And these men will go out and buy acid and pour the acid on these women to disfigure them. Uh, that's the most uh, that's the most procedure we do. And also children. Because of open fire, because a lot of women in these villages and townships, they cook, children are running around, and accidents are bound to happen. And they will eventually, you know, run into a pot of hot water or a pot of soup, and then they get burned. So burns is the number one uh, issue that we deal with when we travel around Africa. Now, when you say developing countries, is this limited to the African continent or you're also doing these, uh, providing these free services in other developing countries across the globe? Thank you. It's not just Africa. We have been to uh, Guatemala, I've been to Mexico, but the issues in Guatemala and Mexico are very different. When we go to Guatemala, the most common procedure we do there is cleft lip and palate. Uh, in uh, Mexico too, it's also cleft lip and palate and some deformities or some uh, congenital deformities of the arms and the legs, of the extremities. Uh, in Asia, in Laos, the same thing, uh, cleft lip and palate. But well, in Ghana, for example, mostly it's burns. In Gabon, it's a mixture. Um, so every country have their own needs. And one of the things that is unique about Restore, you know, we don't just impose our will when we go to these countries. I usually will find a partnering doctor in that locale and I will ask them their basic needs. So when we first started going to Ghana, they told me, you know what, we can take care of brain victims. What we need to learn how to do is breast. Breast cancer were killing women. Women were afraid to go for screening. They were afraid to go see doctors to be diagnosed for breast cancer because of the fact that the surgeons were not trained to do breast reconstruction. So you see women in the ages of 40 to 45 dying of breast cancer. And some of these women, when you interview them, they will tell you, I'd rather die than to lose my man because if I lose a breast, my husband, my boyfriend will no longer be with me, we'll find another woman. And it's a shame that you know, we value women by the, the number of breasts they have or the healthier their breasts are. So we encourage these women. And I remember in 2010, I did the first tram flap, which is a breast reconstruction. We're using a woman's own tissue uh, to mold the breast from the abdominal tissue uh, into the breast uh, region where the breast used to be. And this was done in Kumase. So these are some of the present issues affecting us on this continent. 
Now, obviously, you're spending a lot of time, a lot of money, and uh, like you said, those who come with you, those other doctors and nurses who, who accompany you are doing that of their own free will without getting paid. But regardless, it's still coming at a cost. Talk to us about if there are any partnerships that you're taking advantage of and if there are any complementary uh, partnerships or help uh, being given to you by the, the, con the host countries where you perform these surgeries. But it doesn't come free. It comes at a cost. Uh, just to give you things in perspective, uh, since 2010 or 2008, uh, I have personally infused over $300,000 into Restore. All the volunteers who are companies, which since 2008, we have had over 100 volunteers. They have done it at their own free will with their pay. The only thing that Restore would do for these people is to provide transportation, security, meals in the countries that we visit. I encourage the volunteers to buy their own plane ticket if they can. The ones who we need, who are essential, we still will find a way to pay for their tickets. Some of the host countries have been very helpful, especially Gabon. The last trip we took to Gabon, they bear the entire cost of the travel for the volunteers, as well as uh, the cost that was incurred in the country. Uh, but of course, we don't talk about the opportunity cost, the cost that everybody loses out, or the money that they are not making when they travel. I, for instance, I have lost about a million dollars for not working, for taking on restore trips, which is a blessing for me because the more I do, the more God blesses me. But not everybody can afford to do what I'm doing because of the fact that they have to work and pay their bills. And that's why most volunteers only spend a week. That's how much they can do. Uh, we are always looking for partnership. Uh, Gabon has lent their support. Uh, this, early this year, I received a message from Kenya, where they were willing to donate, I believe, about $50,000 to restore and also pay for everybody's trip, uh, which was very encouraging. So that eases the burden of the amount of money that I have to infuse into restore. So these are some of the things that is happening. And currently, I'm in South Africa to talk to stakeholders in partnering with restore to make restores work, reach more people, and also to also help global health so that... Oh you know, the healthcare conversation can be carried on further. So these are some of the things that are happening right now. All right, Dr. Obang, final question. Now, I know that, uh, in fairness, there are quite a number of African countries that are trying to increase their spending on healthcare, especially at the primary healthcare and community level. Are there things that you've seen, uh, perhaps from a policy perspective, working on the ground, that gives, you, that gives you hope that Africa, you know, perhaps sooner than later, hopefully sooner than later, can begin to catch up, perhaps leapfrog uh, in making its healthcare system a lot better and, of course, also providing uh, healthcare for all? The government alone cannot do it. You know, I think the public, uh, the private sector needs to take a, a, an interest role in advancing the healthcare in Africa. But you know, it all goes back to education. A lot of time, we as people, we feel very invincible. We feel like nothing will happen. Uh, I think the government, one of the roles I think the government can play is uh, you know, monthly educational uh, videos on, on all these platforms. You know, I believe that TV, radio, social media have all have so much power that every week, if every TV station in Africa, if every radio station in Africa dedicated one hour to talk about healthcare, you know, just basic education, exercise, weight, diet, you know, if you don't feel good, go see a doctor. Don't wait till things get worse. If all these little things take place, I think it will also decrease the burden that it puts on the system. You know, everybody waits until they are sick, until they are about to die before they get into the mm -hmm. system. And they are not going to make it when it gets that work, when it gets that bad. But I think if you take baby steps, you know, preventive medicine goes a long way. Thank you, Dr. Obeng, for joining us today and being a part of today's show. I've been speaking to Dr. Micah Obeng, owner of Miko Plastic Surgery. That's it on Beyond Markets. Thank you so much for being a part of it. Remember, you can watch the show at 5 p.m. West African time daily and have access to all previous episodes of the show on our website at cnbcafrica.com. And you can also stay engaged with the hashtag Beyond Markets. And, of course, you can follow my Twitter handle, too, at Esther O. Awoni. For myself and the team, it's bye for now.